Welcome to RSA Conference 2024. We're recording live from Broadcast Alley here in Moscone West. It's day three of RSA Conference. This interview is sponsored by Cisco. I'm your host, Matt Alderman, and joining me for this interview is Jitu Patel. He's the Executive Vice President and General Manager at Cisco in the Security and Collaboration Group. Welcome, G2. Good to see you, Matt. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're going to talk HyperShield. All right. Um, I got to tell you a quick little story, though. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I ran strategy for Tenable uh, for oh. years in 2015. It meets, uh, uh, meets a good guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I helped recruit him over, actually. Um, one of the things in my strategy plan, I said, is there's going to be three security controls that CISOs will always own, regardless of what happens in the cloud. Okay. User, data, and the application. Yep. So that's been a really interesting thesis for me and, and something we've covered on the shows a lot, also around my investment thesis. And it's interesting to see, you know, products continue to evolve in the space. Um, so let's start with why HyperShield? Why'd you build HyperShield? You know, I think every once in a while in tech, and we've seen a few of these um, during our lifetime, the client server revolution, yeah. the mobile, the internet, I think AI is one of those. And I think the scale proportion at which the data centers are going to operate in the future is going to be very different from anything we've ever seen. Yeah. And we are kind of entering into this era of like, uh, which will feel like abundance, where we've lived in a world of scarcity for the past 6,000 years, 7,000 years. We're now going to feel like, you know, we're living in this era of abundance. And here's the challenge is, uh, the data center architecture is, need, is going to need to be fundamentally reimagined yes. on two dimensions, yeah. right? The applications is one where you, you're, not, you're moving from the three-tiered or n-tiered architecture to microservices. There'll be thousands of microservices running on hundreds of hard pieces of hardware and Kubernetes right. containers and VMs. And then the second area is that you know, the specialized computational subsystems, whether it be GPUs or DPUs or LPUs or whatever, th those are going to continue to keep kind of evolving. So you will go much more from sequential to parallel processing and there's the throughput capacity is going to be very different. As that happens, the underlying infrastructure for data centers will also need to change from a security perspective to accommodate for the highly distributed nature um, that, that we are in with applications today. Right. And so t today's infrastructure just doesn't work. Now, securing everything is hard. <laughs> yes. You know, securing applications is hard, securing infrastructure is hard. And there's three challenges that we've been told about time and time over again by our customers that end up being huge, um, you know, kind of bottlenecks for them in doing whatever they need to do to go out and secure the infrastructure. Number one, in this world where you assume that an attacker is already in your system, mm -hmm. and that the way that the attack is going to spread is through, through uh, lateral movement, segmenting is really hard. You know, because it was easy to segment when you had a three-tiered architecture. Like you had a network and you had DMZs and you could, And, and you could yes. just, you know, each piece of hardware could get segmented out. Right. It's very hard to do that when you have microservices uh, on multiple pieces of hardware all talking to each other through APIs. I, I have my payment cluster that can talk to my shopping cart cluster where I can't talk to my developer cluster. How do I go about setting those policies? Super hard to do, right? right? So segmentation is really hard. Number two, um, patching is a huge problem. And what I mean by that is today, the, from the day that, an, um, that a vulnerability is announced, to when an exploit occurs is now single digit days compressing down to hours and minutes. You're right. It takes about 25 to 49 days to actually test and deploy a patch from the time that a vulnerability is announced. You've got this massive gap between when a vulnerability is announced and when you're going to actually patch it and how quickly the adversary is actually going out and doing an exploit. Right. right. And if you're using open source or some other libraries that you don't even control, you know, it even, could be even longer. It could be even, even longer. So, and, and by the way, there might be things that never get patched because mm -hmm. they've gone end of life right. or end of sale or what right. have you. So they, that becomes a really huge problem. And then the third problem is updating dated infrastructure is really hard. And even updates for based on policy changes tends to be really hard. So, um, you know, why is that? Because you have two change control windows, you have to get your system down, there's one at Christmas, one at Fourth of July in the US. It's just a hard thing to go out and coordinate. If you miss that window, you wait another six months. And so I'll tell you an uh, interesting story is, you know, we had a lot of issues with our firewall products a few years ago, and we fixed a lot of those issues. 
and customers would still complain because only 40% of our customers had upgraded to the newest version. Oh, right. Because most people hadn't up up upgraded, right. right? And so, these three problems, segmenting, patching, and updates, were things that we said we, we ought to think about very differently because you you've now have building blocks of technology that just weren't available in the past to be able to reimagine the problem space mm -hmm. and ideally reimagine the solution space very differently. Now, the analogy I like to give people is imagine if Amazon were built in 1475. <laughs> Like it would be an epically failed company because you didn't have the logistics infrastructure in place, you didn't have the PC revolution, you didn't have the internet revolution. So it wouldn't have succeeded, right? We now have all the necessary building blocks to be able to build on top of that could allow us to think about not just a new product, but a completely reimagined architecture. Mm. And, um, and there are three building blocks, if you care for me to share with yes, you. Yes, I want to yeah. know how you solve this. So, the three building blocks are one, um, AI of course, where the operative word in AI is can we build it natively in the product so that when you think about a mechanism for defense, mm -hmm. you've actually thought about it with AI natively in the product rather than an afterthought that's right. patched on. Right. right. So that's number one. And I think it's going to allow us to do magical things that just weren't possible before yeah, in these and, areas. And I, and, and I imagine what you mean by AI is not just an LLM no, no, chat no. bot I, kind of thing, like real I'm artificial intelligence models and engines that can that process and, and manage data, right? That can dynamically segment and adjust segmentation yeah, for you in right. a very different way, yeah. right? Um, things like that. So that's number one. Number two is I think in security specifically, you cannot protect something that you don't have visibility towards. In a world where the endpoint is assumed to be compromised, the attacker is in the system, and there's lateral movement that's occurring, but the, the traffic is going to be end-to-end -end encrypted. It's going to be really hard to tell yeah. what is out of the pattern of um, normal that's actually flowing through your network, right. right? And so what you have to have is you need to make sure that you know where a process is originating and where it terminates. And you have to know also what's at, where, where, it's trans where it's being transmitted. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge is, because of end-to-end -end encryption, you, your visibility goes down quite a bit on the transmission. So what you need to have is enough um, observability on the server side, on the host, mm -hmm. to know exactly the I.O. operations and the processes that are getting kick-started yep. in the operating system at the kernel level, yeah. right? And eBPF is a technology, I know you've actually um, been very familiar with this. eBPF is a technology that can really be game changing in this one it area. It gives you that visibility. It gives you that visibility without sitting in the kernel. It sits in user space, right. but it gives you all the in, all the inputs you need to have to know what's actually transpiring right. at every I.O. Le level and at every I.O. operation and every pro every process. Right. That's, did that process that's fork, did it crash, did it restart? That's exactly. Did it create a network connection? H having spent time in the container security space, that visibility is so important, especially if you can't get it at other layers in the stack. That's exactly yeah. right. So that's the second one. Yeah. So the first one was AI. The second one is kernel level visibility via eBPF. Mm -hmm. And the third one then is hardware acceleration. We've had this kind of era that we're living in with high performance computing where we've moved from sequential processing on CPUs to GPUs and DPUs. And what I'm talking about specifically is DPUs for which are basically data processing units that sit on NICs that are specialized subsystems that really allow you to do repetitive network functions like connection management, encryption, and security operations at very different scale proportions. So right. you could probably be a thousand times faster than what you used to be in the past, mm. right? And so the combination of those three allow us to do things that are magical where you don't have to think about taking 40 days to segment your applications. You could have autonomous segmentation. You don't need to figure out a way to wait for 49 days for a patch getting applied. You can actually have near instantaneous distributed exploit protection without patching uh, that can be put in mm. place. So f about eight to 12 to 15 minutes from the time that a vulnerability is announced, we might be able to have a compensating control that can shield that vulnerability instantly. Interesting. Right? So kind of like the old virtual patching concept back in the day, but actually applying it almost in real time. And distribute it out to every enforcement point that you might have. So what we would do is you would basically take security and take it to the workload rather than bringing the workload to the security. Got it. So yeah. every IoT device, every OT device, every, uh, every microservice, every container 
um, will actually have this shield in front of it that can do auto segmentation, autonomous segmentation. It can do, um, you know, kind of um, instantaneous compensating controls, near instantaneous compensating controls. And then the third thing it does is this notion of updates, right? Imagine if you had your updates in infrastructure that happen like your iPhone happens, mm -hmm. where it's almost near instantaneous, um, but it's, it's, it's fully autonomous, by the way. It's self-qualifying, but it doesn't happen without testing out what the changes are. The big challenges that you have, the reason that people don't do automatic updates to the firewalls right now is not because you can't do it. It's because they're worried that something's going to break because the firewall right. rules were written by Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin, way, way back when, retired, and then someone else has come in, and, and so there's this right. issue. <coughs> and so what we need to do is figure out a way that you can have autonomous updates, self-qualifying updates. And so the way that we do it is, you can have two simultaneous data paths, version one and version two, right? Not in a simulated environment, in your production in environment. In real time. In real time, to see the difference. And the only reason you can do that is silicon is so fast now that you can actually have two parallel data paths that are going mm. with, this, with, with, the, with the same stream of data. And then you do a diff at the end. You say, oh well, version one and version two don't look like they're that different after running it for 30 days. It's actually good for us to go out and swap the primary to the shadow and the shadow to the primary. Run it for another 15 days. And then you can automatically update. And you can have a human in the loop as long as you don't trust the system and once you start trusting right. the system. Like the first few times when I actually did my iPhone updates, I would always back up my iPhone, make sure everything was okay before I did the update. I don't do that anymore, it just happens at night. Yeah. But that's because the trust got built over time. Right. And so we've, those are the three things that HyperShield does that completely are game changing from an architecture perspective. Well, you brought up trust, right? We, yep. A lot of people don't trust AI yet, yes. right? Because in an LLM, it could hallucinate, right? So you're not going to let your systems just run autonomously Absolutely. with AI decision making, yes. right? But where AI is really good, and which is where I think you're focused is, it, it gives you the ability to monitor activities, monitor stuff, help make recommendations around decisions yep. that help you build a level of trust with it so that over time, it may do more things automatically, but it's giving us power that we never had before yep. at scale. And, and I, you I think would that's always a have a human in the loop. Right. If you have a human in the loop, you can make the decision until you say, okay, this is fine. I'm right. now starting to see enough data points where I feel comfortable in this particular area. I don't need to have a human in the loop. And if you always want to have a human in the loop, more power to you. Right. Yeah, and I think that's what people need to figure out, yep. right, over time. I, I remember the days of intrusion protection systems. You, you probably have some of these scars from way back when, right? Yep. Nobody would put them in prevention mode that's because right. nobody trusted that they no wouldn't shut down exactly. a part of the network that would stop traffic flow. That's why people don't auto update the firewalls, right? Those are some of the challenges. We're going to face the same things with some of these AI systems. People are going to want to see how it works. They're going to want to see the, the efficiency that can gain them, and then, as they trust it more and more, then turn these things on. And th this, by the way, this is not a new, uh, you shouldn't think about this as just a new product from Cisco. This is a brand new way of thinking about security, which is hyper-distributed. Right. And the security is wherever you need it to be, in front of every workload on an oil rig, on an MRI machine, in a robot welder, on a, uh, on a drone, mm -hmm. uh, in your data center, in your infrastructure, wherever you need it to be, we will make sure that security enforcement points will be made distributed but fully coordinated with each other. Well, in a world where the perimeter is the endpoint, the IoT device, the phone, the That's human, right. That's right. you have to be distributed. You have to be distributed. Or you're not going to be able to solve these challenges. Th exactly right. And the way we think about this is, you know, in a world which is going to be end-to-end -end encrypted, most workloads are going to be distributed all over the different place. You need to make sure that you know what's originating from the endpoint and what's terminating at the host. Right. And have full visibility across the board. Um, otherwise, you're not going to be able to protect and have the right level of defenses. And thus HyperShield. Thus HyperShield. G2, thank you so much for joining us on this interview segment. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. If anybody wants to get more information, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Cisco RSAC. Uh, and also check out all of our coverage from RSA Conference at securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC. Stay tuned, we have more interviews on the way.